hear Nancy talk. I know she's very busy these days. So Nancy, thank you very much. And uh, the floor to you. My pleasure. Thanks, Manu. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. So what I'd like to do today is uh, share with you not only uh, some examples of success stories in ocean conservation, but also some thoughts about how we create more and create and, and grow the ones that we have so they're really at scale to uh, meet the, the scale of the challenge that we face. So um, this is really an area, of course, of uh, real opportunity right now. All day yesterday, the day before I was part of the uh, U.S. National Committee's launch of the United Nations Decade for um, Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, the motto for which is the science we need for the ocean we want. And, and I think one of the messages of that meeting um, was that I think everyone is really committed to working on this problem. It's not really clear exactly what the science we need is, or even to some extent what the ocean we want is. So this is an area that people are talking a lot about, uh, and this and it's not like the answers are all out there. It's a it's a work in progress. But it, I think the fact that um, this decade has been launched actually offers a uh, particularly good opportunity for making forward progress at a more rapid speed than we have been up until now. So what I'd like to do is just share quickly some examples of successes that we've had uh, in ocean conservation and uh, also the limits to those successes. And then at the very end, sort of explore what I think are some, what are some of the messages that, um, that we can draw from that combination of success, but limitation to success. So one of the uh, early successes that we had um, was actually uh, the result of banning DDT uh, in the United States in 1972, thanks to uh, Rachel Carson's book, uh, Silent Spring, published 10 years earlier. And as a result of that effort, which uh, took 10 years between 1962 and 72, eventually DDT was banned. And the result has been the recovery of all sorts of birds of prey, including many that are very important for ocean ecosystems, such as ospreys and pelicans. It's a huge success story. It's one that's so well established in some ways that we tend to forget about it, which is, I think, unfortunate because we really re need to remember the successes we have. That's one of the reasons I launched um, Ocean Os optimism with others um, in the very beginning in 2014 was a feeling that we'd actually sort of lost track of uh, or weren't paying attention to the successes we'd actually already achieved. Um, here's another one, the recovery of puffins is a little close to where I live um, in rural Maine on the coast of Maine. And the, uh, the recovery of puffins is really due to a combination of political action, which is the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and then science, which was uh, particularly the work of Stephen Kress, who associated with the Audubon. He realized that puffins uh, wouldn't necessarily come back even after their hunting was eliminated by the M Migratory Bird Treaty Act because they're social creatures. They don't like being all by themselves on a rock. And so what he did was put um, uh, wooden puffins on the, on some of these uh, rocky islands where they used to live, uh, but were no longer there. Uh, put wooden puffins there. He played puffin songs and he even transplanted a few baby puffins from places in Canada that uh, where puffin populations still remained. The result has been the recovery from one breeding pair of puffins in Maine. Uh, to hundreds of breeding pairs. And this method has now been very widely used for seabirds around the world because so many of, so many seabird sea species are in fact social in the same way that puffins are. Another example is recovery of sea turtles. Uh, this was an analysis published only a few years ago showing that 12 out of 17 populations of sea turtles, those are the ones in green, are actually uh, increasing. Uh, and in some cases they've increased uh, to a really, from a really low level to surprisingly high levels in a fairly short amount of time. So this is definitely an example of a success in terms of um, the recovery of sea turtles. Of course, it's not just the things that we protect to simply have them around, it's also the ability to manage species wisely uh, for those that we use uh, for food or other reasons. Here's an example of uh, a success story from California, the recovery of the commercial catch due to the banning of nearshore gillnets uh, in 1994, uh, which were uh, uh, having a very detrimental effect because they were trapping so many um, 
uh, reproductive individuals who are coming to nearshore habitats in order to breed, got rid of the nearshore uh, gill nets and the catch has recovered. Um, and here are two other kinds of examples of how we've learned to fish much more wisely. Um, some of them are small scale bottom up collaboratives uh, represented by organizations called TERFs or Territorial Users Rights for Fishers. Uh, an example on the left for Chile, which has many, many of these now on the coast, all those little red dots are examples of these communities that have banded together to cooperatively and collaboratively manage their uh, fisheries resources, including for this creature called the uh, loco in Spanish, it's a, or sometimes called the Chilean abalone, although it's not actually an abalone. And you can see that the number of abalones per square uh, meter in turfs is actually the same as it is in no-take marine protected areas. So these are, these are very successful small scale collaborations. And then on a more top down basis, um, individual transferable quotas have been used by a number of countries uh, to uh, structure the fishing industry in such a way that uh, incentivizes long term management, uh, sustainable management, and it's been shown that these uh, ITQs, when implemented properly, and there's a lot of devil in the details here, but when implemented properly, reduce the collapse probability by about 50%. But stepping back um, uh, and to sort of looking at species protections and management overall, this is an analysis done by a uh, paper I was part of, Duarte et al, 2020, published in Nature. And you see here on the left, the fish stock trends, uh, either increasing, declining, or no change. And on the right, marine management, marine mammal uh, population trends, again, increasing, decreasing, or no change. And so you can see there's plenty of, to celebrate. There's quite a lot of blue there. And, and the fact that there are some that at least aren't decreasing is good, but there's still way too much red. And we need to get some of that beige uh, into the blue category. So plenty to celebrate, but much work to be done. Now let's check a, a turn now to, to uh, sort of move from species uh, actions to actions that have to do do with uh, ocean real estate. And in the last 20 years, we've had seen a huge increase in marine protected areas, which you show here from about 3 million to 26 million kilometers squared. Now, um, some of these um, have been, and increasingly there's been uh, interest in protecting big and remote places. Um, and here are two examples, one, the Ross Sea in Antarctica, which is the result of an international treaty. Uh, and the other in the Seychelles, which was just announced 30% um, protection of Seychelles waters. This was due to a, a, a collaboration between the Nature Conservancy, where I actually I sit on the global board of the Nature Conservancy and the Seychelles government in a 30 million, over $30 million debt for nature swap. Uh, these are very complex financial instruments. Uh, I've had them explained to me several times. I don't really understand them as a biologist, but the bankers have been very creative and innovative uh, in this context to creating uh, a very important marine protected area in the tropical Indian Ocean. Uh, and then in terms of restoring uh, marine real estate, here are some, uh, a few other examples. We've uh, had uh, definite examples of progress in terms of restoring seagrass beds. The example in Tampa Bay is now a number of years old, but uh, seagrass in Tampa Bay has recovered to 1950s levels which is a really extraordinary success rate. And more recently, a paper was just published about the recovery of seagrasses in the lagoons of Virginia. Again, a really dramatic turnaround, which you can see from, uh, from, from 2001 until 2018, uh, going from essentially no seagrass, the little yellow spots to very dense seagrass beds. And now even birds are, that are dependent on the seagrasses are returning uh, to those locations. And we've also made quite a bit of progress in restoring islands. You may say, well, wh why, why is this even on the list of ocean restoration? Um, of course, these many of these islands, including South Georgia, which is what you see here, have very important uh, marine populations, in this case, uh, penguin, penguins. Uh, South Georgia, they were able to eliminate rats. It was the largest rat eradication effort by an order of magnitude. It uh, was successful. It took a number of years involving dropping of uh, bat, uh, rat uh, baits uh, you see there by helicopter and also dogs um, literally walking across the island um, to sniff out at, for evidence of rats. But it has now been successful and, and a number of birds are um, returning to 
South Georgia are increasing in numbers uh, from very low numbers previously. And these methods have now been applied in a number of other places, including Palma is a, is a very important uh, coral reef environment um, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean where they have recently been able to eliminate all the rats. And in addition to returning, um, in addition to having seabirds recover, rat elimination around coral reefs results in increased nutrients to seaweeds, which reduce, results in increased um, uh, growth of herbivorous fish. So it actually has knock-on benefits, not only for the seabirds themselves, but also for the reefs uh, that surround these seabird islands. Uh, we've also uh, made a lot of progress in learning how to restore rivers. This is often a matter of taking down dams that are no longer useful. And you see a picture that's actually about a five minute drive from my home. Uh, and the result has been the recovery of uh, a number of uh, fish that need to, uh, that spend part of their lifetimes in seawater in, sea in the ocean, but have to swim up rivers uh, and into lakes to spawn. And alewife numbers are now much, much higher than they uh, were before this, these efforts to uh, uh, restore the free passage from the ocean to the freshwater habitats. But, but again, looking back um, in terms of stepping back and thinking about it more comprehensively, again, from the Duarte et al. paper, you can see that the trend lines are moving mostly in the right direction. The numbers are too, still too small. So for example, for MPAs, the percent of the ocean area protected by MPAs is still a little less than 8%, whereas the global goal is about 30% by 2030. And similarly, you can see a, a real growth in the number of restoration efforts uh, on the right, but most of these are pretty small. And, um, and the F areas that have been restored versus the areas that uh, are still in bad shape is, is still uh, way too small. Of course, there's been a huge energy revolution. I'm sure all of you are aware of the energy revolution. Uh, it's really uh, now, I think, well past tipping points. Uh, and uh, it's, um, of course, has enormous implications for the health of the ocean because uh, climate change uh, is, has already uh, wreaked havoc, for example, with coral reef ecosystems around the world. So on the left, you see my house and my electric car with my house with the solar panels and my electric car. And that makes me feel good. But the really important part of this revolution is the image to the right, the 590,000 homes powered by, for example, this, uh, these ocean-based uh, wind turbines. And uh, the reason for this energy revolution, of course, is uh, technology. And here you see the price levels of various forms of energy. Uh, solar is in yellow and um, wind is in blue. And they are now, in most places, the cheapest form of energy available, far cheaper on a per kilowatt hour base than uh, non-renewable uh, energy sources such as gas. Um, or uh, coal or new. So this is really a victory for technology. The reason they are cheaper is the, and which allowed them to be uh, taken up at scale. But it's also a victory of policy. And this is a really example, I think, an interesting example from Norway on use of electric vehicles. Norway now leads the world, 60% of the new car registrations being electric vehicles. And how did they do this? This was a number of political steps, uh, which involved uh, reduced or no uh, purchase taxes on the, on the vehicles, reduced or no fares in terms of use of roads or uh, fares, fares on ferries or parking fees, and then even fiscal compensation for people willing to scrap their gas vehicles uh, prematurely. And as a result, um, you have this enormous growth in the uptake of electric vehicles, which, uh, for example, the United States is growing, but not nearly at that level. Now, of course, we have to think also every sort of conservation benefit has the potential to have some unintended consequences. Here you see a sort of very long article from the Washington Post last year about how mining for some of these um, materials that are needed to produce electric vehicle batteries can have very negative local consequences for, for example, in this case, the coral reefs that fringe this Indonesian village. And we've solved, we're in the process of solving what we're in also in the process of creating new problems. So conservation is always kind of a long-term, long-haul process. It's often two steps forward, one step back, sometimes 
two steps backwards, one step forward. Uh, but more often than not, we're making progress, but it doesn't mean we can't, uh, we have to pay attention to these problems as well. Uh, and then what about the plastic revolution? Now, this is one that is really not nearly as far along as the energy revolution, but we are seeing some signs of uh, progress, both in terms of um, the uh, government policies. I, I was recently in Tanzania where that's really illegal to own a plastic bag in the country. So the bags that you are given when you go shopping are uh, non-plastic. The, the beverages are served in glass bottles by and large. So a real reduction in use uh, in the country as well. There's some interesting experiments in terms of how to capture plastic that's, that's on the verge of getting into the ocean. For example, the Mr. Trash Wheel solar powered uh, operation in Baltimore. And then of course, a whole bunch of new potential um, uh, materials innovations, such as the one shown here uh, that um, by, uh, uh, shown by Lucy Hughes, who won the James Dyson Award for the innovation of the bio uh, biologically based compostable alternative to fossil fuel plastics. Uh, now, there's, there is, there's a long, really long way to go in terms of plastic. This is a recent study uh, by Pew, there's a paper in science, and this is a longer sort of, um, it was look at the various kinds of solutions we have to addressing the plastic pollution problem. Um, and comparing business as usual to a variety of alternatives. And they, they categorize those alternatives as reducing the actual use of plastic, for example, just by simply not wrapping things up in plastic and, and having other delivery methods or, or um, being able to reuse some uh, shipping methods. Substitution, that's what I referred to, the different kinds of substitution materials. And the ones they considered actually, because they are solutions at hand, are things as simple as paper, encoded paper and other compostable materials. Recycling, and then dispo better disposal so the plastic, when it is disposed of, doesn't wind up in the ocean. So what they uh, did in this analysis is look at all the things, you know, sort of the options that are on the table and what they could accomplish. And what they found is you get a really substantial reduction in uh, plastic pollution in the ocean using solutions that we already have in hand. But that left about 10% of the plastic by 2040 that was still basically bis being mismanaged, winding up in the environment. And for those, you're gonna need new innovations, both in terms of the uh, science of plastic itself, but also in terms of uh, new business models, in terms of how we uh, operate our economy and, and at the same time avoid massive amounts of plastic. We do nothing, the business as usual scenario is the estimate is something like 50 kilograms of plastic per meter of coastline. So it's clearly a huge problem. And, uh, and even when you only have 10% mismanaged by the solutions at hand, 10% of a really large number is still a really large number. So we're gonna definitely need some innovations. So uh, to summarize, cause I know um, this is supposed to be a quick talk. I guess the basic message is that there's no silver, silver bullet. We'll need new natural science. We'll need new social science. We'll need to better use existing science which is a form of social science. And then we're gonna need of course, imagination, money and time. And I put fast and slow uh, next to time because I think it's really uh, interesting how change occurs. Uh, some change occurs very quickly. There's a wonderful quote from Bill Gates which says um, we always overestimate the amount of change that will take place in two years, but underestimate the amount of change that will take place in 10. I think the plastic situation 10 years from now, and certainly the energy situation is going to be very different than it is now in ways that might be ha hard to imagine. But some of the change really is slow change. Um, and that's because uh, it involves relationships among people. And uh, I've been actually involved in a number of discussions about indigenous uh, indigenous contributions to conservation and working, uh, at, for example, conservation NGOs working with indigenous communities. And, and one of the quotes that really stuck with me was that repair of these relationships and therefore the landscape operates at the speed of trust. And the speed of trust is slow, especially if it's been uh, severely damaged over decades. And so I think we have to operate on both those timeframes and realize that some things may happen really fast and please us, but some things may happen slowly. And so here just to conclude are a few coral reef examples. Um, the paper on the right by Anthony et al. And, and, uh, was a, 
uh, showed sort of an illustration of the combination of traditional methods and brand new methods that we really don't yet totally understand how to deploy, uh, including um, assisted things like assisted gene flow. The yellow, all the orange arrows are these new technologies we don't really have at scale yet. Um, assisted gene flow, habitat modification, and uh, assisted evolution, and then some very traditional ones such as no-take areas, pest management, and pollution management. Um, I think an example of a really innovative uh, 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 social science uh, uh, solution for coral reefs is this idea of actually using insurance. And in fact, uh, the first such insurance policy for a Mexican coral reef was triggered by a hurricane and paid for local people to uh, uh, restore the reef by gluing the up putting back upright the large corals and gluing the small fragments back to the bottom. And then there's some uh, very innovative uh, new consortia like this one, Monaco, which has to do with a connection between researchers and reef conservation stakeholders. And then Bonaire, which is a wonderful example of a conservation success in Caribbean, a place where most reefs are actually still in pretty terrible condition. That's just an, one example of what they've done. That's the tag that you spend, for, it costs $45 every year to dive on the, in the waters of Bonaire and those $45 that are paid uh, help cover the cost of conservation. So there are lots of different kinds of solutions, some old, some new, some still in progress. Um, uh, and both the natural sciences and the social sciences have a really important role to play. And so with that, I think I'll stop and take questions. Thank you.